what the controller should be doing, in my humble opinion, is sticking with the original. Either give them an initial approach fix, clear them for the approach, and leave them alone, or actually give them vectors to final because you told them you were going to, mm -hmm. and never go back and give them a fix name. If you as a controller say, fly heading 240, vectors to final approach course as the pilot, I'm going to wipe out all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. I get final approach fix and a big line that goes out from that, standing into forever, that I'm then expecting a turn to join. And then maybe even you go so far as to turn me on base. And then on the base somewhere you say, clear direct to this fix. What? Ready. This is Opposing Bases Air Traffic Talk. Your host, Romeo Hotel and Alpha Golf, have a combined 40 years of aviation experience as pilots and air traffic controllers. They answer your questions and share their opinions about flying and air traffic control. This show is not official guidance and should not be used as a replacement for your instructor, your pilot examiner, the endless books of regulations, your favorite comedian, your neighbor, your spouse, or your cat. November 628 Charlie Delta Squawk 1200 frequency change approved. The audio will be available on live ATC. Good day. November 643 Juliet Mike, clear visual approach from way 23 left, connect hour. November 3222 Yankee, area of heavy to extreme precipitation, 10 o'clock to 1 o'clock, 15 miles, 7 Range miles. Uh, 3047 Charlie, try a departure, radar contact, climb and maintain. November 747 Sierra Lima, reduce speed to 180, you're overtaking traffic ahead on fun. Skyhawk 77 Tango, IFR cancellation received, squawk via far, frequency change approved. Sierra 720 Fox, Tron Alpha, flatting 190 vectors for the visual approach, Skyhawk runway 23 left. To enter triad class Charlie surface area from the east, maintain special. Charlie Fox, Fox Golf Fox, Tron Alpha, this is triad approach, on guard. You are being intercepted. The border is still closed, say intentions. Please welcome your favorite controllers, Alpha Golf and Romeo Hotel. It's Monday, July 12, 2021, episode 185. On today's show, we'll discuss how air traffic can really help a pilot out with a basic understanding of what's happening during an RNAV approach, the hold for release phraseology, and same runway separation. What's up, AJ? Hello. Hello, everyone. Happy Tuesday. Yes. Question we are, mark? Hmm, well, the, the masses will hear this on a Monday. Uh -huh. Those of you in the chat room are hearing this today. It will be released early. We're trying to get around some scheduling snafus for the month of July. Mm -hmm. And we're getting a week ahead. Yes. You and I worked together last night. I'm trying to think if we have any good work stories from last night. Oh, we do. We had a few people fly through our airspace. We did. Mm. <laughs> we did. And as per usual, <laughs> I was disparaged publicly. <laughs> For never being at work, supposedly. No, the well, that was also said, but I think the lead in was I had said hello to somebody. I, and then I, before I got uh, out of position, I said, Hey, there's a new guy coming on position. He's he's pretty new, so go easy on him. And he said, Who is it, AG? The most newly certified controller in the building. <laughs> AG. <laughs> Uh, we got a good laugh about that. Mm. Mm. I do think we have feedback coming up at some point about me being the most recertified controller in the building, mm. holding some sort of record. Yes. I need to find that audio. They asked me about that last night. I did check off one of my to-do items with the audio that we're going to open up with today. Mm. But I don't have that other one. The one where he asked about... You, okay, I know which one you're talking about. I have not parsed that out. And, and I think I saw that in the inbox. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, not much new okay. because we just worked last night. But I did find the audio that you and I discussed, and I fixed this last night when I got home. You want to hear that? Oh, wow. You, you must have been up late. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to sleep anyway, so I might as well do something. Oh, right. <laughs> Here we go. 
Greensboro approach, Delta 2662, that's what you were passing, 13 and 6. Hold on, I, I didn't give the disclaimer. None of this has anything to do with the triad or any other podcast host to protect the innocent. This right, right. <laughs> oh, yes, no other, right. No one that we know uh, certainly would not be from, <laughs> no, it's just, nope. uh, yeah. It's it's not AG. It's not RH. It's it's. This is just random controllers. In no, a conversation. Random. Yeah, we thought it was funny. Airline captain. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll I'll start over. Okay. Greensboro approach. Delta twenty six sixty two. That's what you were passing. Thirteen at six for one one thousand. Delta twenty six sixty two. Greensboro approach. Runway two three left. Roger two three left. Delta twenty six. Delta 26-62 is uh, AG working today? Yeah, I actually uh, requested to be on position for this VIP movement. And uh, you guys may have a little bit of a delay. They're still rolling out the red carpet. Okay, I understand. <laughs> that makes sense. Uh, so here's the deal. Uh, we'd like uh, vectors for the ILS-23 left, uh, full procedure followed by the best, and then uh, maybe the uh, VOR, DME, and runway 23 left uh, to a mess, and then... Uh, the R and two three left. Can you accommodate that? Do you want the published myths on all of those? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> just kidding, of course. <laughs> Dick Tower just called me and said unable, so uh, I was more than happy to accommodate that, but uh, yeah, I guess they couldn't. Okay, well, thanks for trying. And I don't know where they found a 150 foot wide by two mile long red carpet, but I think they're all done with it now. Very good, very good. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder if we, uh, this is a Delta 2662, uh, are you going to be able to accommodate the uh, Delta visual today? Is that like the 20 or 15 mile final? That would be like 20 plus. <laughs> All right, I'll let the center know you're going to go back into the airspace and uh, I'll, I'll work it out. <laughs> okay, <laughs> just kidding. Did you guys see the, the field on the downwind? You can turn your own base. Oh, okay, thank you. I can't see anything but clouds out here now. 2662, descend and maintain 6,000. Okay. Delta 2662, we're continuing down to 6,000. Delta 2662 does have the airport site. Delta 2662, clear visual approach, runway 23 left. Clear the visual to 23 left, Delta 2662. Thank you. This guy flying the jet here, man. He's a former Navy Hornet driver and a former U.S. Air Force A-10 driver, so it should be pretty much a perfect visual approach. No pressure. A-10 is what I always wanted to fly, and somehow ended up in helicopters. Yeah, I, to me, that's pretty much the same thing. Slow and slow, I guess. Yeah, except for your, you didn't have as big a gun. That's what she said. I didn't have my 9mm. <laughs> I mean, not to add any pressure, but the, the heavy 7.6 FedEx that arrived prior to you did turn a one-mile base to final. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's too late for that. We're turning base now. Delta 2662. 2662. It has been a pleasure. Contact Tower. I enjoyed it. AG, hey, take care. Oh, hmm. yeah. I got a kick out of that. Thank you for for sending that to us. Um. <clears throat> That controller has my initials, same initials as me. It's sort of weird. And the same sense of humor. It's it's really uncanny, really. Mm. Mm. Some some facility is very lucky. They are. <laughs> Just random pilot check in, ask for AG. Sure, he's here. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Uh it's good to hear from him. And he sent me a message prior to arriving in the airspace. I said I'm not there, but <laughs> I know someone who will be there. Mm. Have fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. I came back early from break, and uh, the guy I was getting out said, "You're back already?" I said, "Yeah, mm -hmm. I gotta work. I gotta work this guy here." <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that is the beginning of our show for today. We'll move into the show if you want. Mm -hmm. All right. Since Ob One Eighty Four, we don't have any new patrons. It was a day ago. If you'd like to learn more about supporting the show, check out patreon.com slash opposing bases. Our patrons get access to our YouTube streaming video of each recording, like today. 
and they get early episodes and we have an rss feed for patrons only for bonus material it's a lot of fun if you're interested check it out if you haven't done so already leave us a review and a five-star rating on your podcast player and don't forget to hit subscribe or follow depending on what podcast player or app you use so our episodes are waiting for you each week thank you everybody thank you boop 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 boop, boop, boop. terrain terrain oh ah Announcements and reviews. You want to do the review? Okay. Uh, let's see. Ooh, I had a little lag there. Mm. Uh, announcements and reviews. Fun and educational. <laughs> RH and AG take the strict and mysterious world of air traffic control and make it accessible and educational as an always learning pilot they've taught me how to be a better safer pilot while making me laugh a lot and cry twice genuinely <laughs> stuff. When, gosh when do we make you cry i really am curious about that crying through laughter or were you really upset about something mm. i mean i know we really pushed the boundaries here but <laughs> man <laughs> i think it was quite to that level uh, well, hopefully we didn't play one of your audios or something that was embarrassing because we try not to do that so right mm-hmm. and if we do we try not to list your name phone number address <laughs> i mean we try it doesn't always work like that but all right that's all we don't have any announcements no announcements mm -mm. Timely feedback. Timely. We do have timely feedback, though. I'll get number one. Go ahead. From Patreon, Romeo Mike. Last episode, yesterday, when we recorded, they asked about their non-flying partner in the airplane getting help from air traffic control if for some reason they became incapacitated. And they said, AG and RH, listen to episode 184, some live, some after the fact today. Thanks for getting my feedback on, and I will play back your response from my non-flying partner. Just to follow up, we're working with a beach-specific instructor in an effort to get her comfortable with landing the plane. For those of you who don't know, beach is a brand. We're not talking about sand and water. We're talking about an airplane brand, <laughs> a beach-specific instructor to get her comfortable with landing the plane. She's not interested in becoming a pilot. And honestly, the chances of me becoming incapable of operating the plane during one of our trips are pretty slim. You just jinxed yourself, man. Mm. <laughs> you can't say that. Mm. <laughs> but who knows? She's pretty much, I'm sorry, she's pretty sharp cookie and does not get rattled easily. You guys made some great points, and I'm sure she will feel better knowing someone or many is going to be there for her focusing on nothing but getting her down safely. Again, thanks for all your help. Great show. Keep up the good work. Romeo Mike. Cool. I'm glad we got to talk about that yesterday. Yeah. Um, I may have implied that there might be somebody that would just throw their hands in the air and give up. I don't know that you're going to find any facility in the NAS where the controllers aren't going to get as creative as possible to give you assistance. I'm confident that, that would happen in anywhere you go. Yes. If, whether it be just a tower, a tracon, a busy center, they're going to find a way to give you as much help as possible. So I agree. Cool. You want to get number two? Number two. Uh, <laughs> Is your computer Sorry. not working? No. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was doing the banners because <laughs> you you killed my banner time when wow. we skipped through the intro, which, interestingly enough, was my suggestion that I skipped over. Ah, see, because I started like... to make it and then thought, no, I haven't done the banners. I need this time. <laughs> <laughs> just never mind number two from romeo lima i decided last minute to go flying on the fourth of july night to see the fireworks with my friend doing the run up mag drop was well within limits and everything looked good however on takeoff roll one of the first things i look at is rpm and i was getting 1900 to 2000 which was very low for a 172 it took a second for it to click in my brain to in my brain to figure out something wasn't right. First thing I thought of was the recent bonus episode about that engine failure on takeoff. And I specifically remember him saying that the RPM was low, but didn't think anything of it. 
Then I instantly thought of what the news headline would be, Fourth of July tragedy. At that point, I collected my thoughts and aborted the takeoff. Mm. Wow. A lot went through your head in a very Mm -hmm. short amount of time. Yeah. Um, I remember prior to the flight, I was kind of rushing through the pre-flight, taxiing faster than I should have been, and kind of just had the mindset of we got to get up there before the fireworks end. That's the mindset that I'm not proud I had. And good thing your podcast is keeping me in check. Maybe I'm too busy overthinking what part of the hand is the upper peninsula <laughs> of Michigan. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> ah, love the show, Romeo Lima. Well, good. That's a great outcome from yeah. you know, that story. Mm. Um, good, good decision. So normal call outs that I can remember and they're different depending on who you fly with and what sort of procedures or school or rental place uses, but airspeed alive is a good one. It shows that you've taken off all the covers and your pedo instruments are free from anything. Right. Uh, you should be looking to make sure all pressure and temperature is good. We're talking the most basic of airplanes. And if you notice that the RPM is low, not generating enough power, that is one that I think would be overlooked by a lot of people as something important and maybe not part of that initial scan as you're rolling down the runway. So good for you for catching it. And the easiest thing to do is pull the power back, break, get off the runway and figure it out. Not airborne. Very nice. Yeah. Good. Yeah. That's good. We're kind of patting ourselves on the back on that one. That We've made an impact on somebody. It happens sometimes. <laughs> it does. Even a blind squirrel... <laughs> You're gonna climbs a tree. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on. Okay. <laughs> All right, today's show topic is brought to you by SCAG. Patron and Darth Pilot sent in some audio. We'll do our best to break down his questions. I'll go ahead and play it now. Hello, gentlemen. My question today pertain to the allowable means for ATC to put an aircraft onto an instrument approach. But first, a little context. So a long time ago, during my instrument training, back when there were three colors of avgas, citations were a new model, and you were definitely going to be flying an NDB approach on your check ride. There were only two <laughs> means by which you could commence an instrument approach, either from an initial approach fix or radar vectors to final, and that was it. In the early 2000s, a third method was approved wherein properly equipped RNAV aircraft could now be sent direct to an intermediate fix with some caveats, which for Captain Nick are spelled out in the Airman's Information Manual, Section 5-4-6. For the last few years, though, controllers seem to have interpreted this to mean that they can send pilots to any fix on an instrument approach procedure. And herein lies the problem. Many modern FMS systems do not deal well with that situation. Without getting too deep into the weeds, the systems have strict rules for lateral and vertical courses in the approach environment. And the vertical profile in particular can be significantly altered by sending an aircraft to an unexpected fix at the last minute. This sometimes causes the FMS to metaphorically throw its hands up and say, what the hell do you want me to do now? And this, of course, requires pilot intervention. The end result is an increased workload for pilots in an already work-intensive situation. We're running checklists, reconfiguring the aircraft, communicating in the cockpit and on the radio, slowing the aircraft. And now ATC wants us to modify the approach, which on my FMS requires no less than 11 separate actions. For comparison, a simple radar vector would require two actions and yield the same result that ATC wants. My questions are these. Is there a rule in the dot .65 that allows controllers to clear aircraft direct to a fix that is not an initial or intermediate fix. Next, why has the radar vector seemingly fallen out of favor for RNAV approaches? And lastly, why not use the ATIS to tell pilots how we can expect to be guided to the approach, you know, like a radar vector or direct to a particular fix or a procedure turn? That is certainly better information than reminding us that birds exist on planet Earth. <laughs> so thanks for your time, and I look forward to your answers. Thank you, Darth Pilot. And you are joining us in the chat room today. Hopefully we 
answer your questions today. We've gone back and forth a little bit. I have an example I'm ready to pull up that is relevant to this conversation. All right. Mm, take the banner off so we can see the whole thing. Well, I'll, probably, I'll actually, take the banner off. Jeez. Sorry. I worked was... so hard on that banner, but it's fine. We'll just right. throw it away. I'll just put it in the trash can. <laughs> All right. I have just a, a profile view. or It's just a plan view. Plan okay. view. Plan view of the RNAV GPS runway 28 right at Oakland. And we have a couple of the things that they talked about in the audio. Bub is the initial approach fix. And NAGV is a intermediate fix. Mm -hmm. And then symbol down there is the kind of the brother sister fix of Bub. Right. They meet up at NAGV and from NAGV inbound 278 degree course. And you go to Grove and a bunch of other fixes we can't pronounce before you get to the final approach fix, Kovsa. All right, mm -hmm. let's 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 back up and talk in context here All right. and sort of answer some of the big picture stuff. I, I kind of want to go backwards. Why do we prefer using a fix instead of the vector to final? Let's just assume for argument's sake for you and I, because I think it's more common in our airspace to give an initial approach fix and not some other random fix. But why do we prefer that? Um, well, for one, that's most obvious to me, we don't have approaches like this. Mm -hmm. We don't have approaches with just a bunch of non labeled fixes. Step downs really is what they are mm -hmm. without seeing the profile view, but I'm assuming, and I can't, it's the letters are very small. It's hard for me to see, but I'm assuming that each one of these it's an altitude letdown. It is. Grove to Urzaf is down to 2,700 from 34, and then again down to 21. It is. They're exactly what you said. They're step downs. So, uh, well, I mean, even if we did, you can't send somebody. There's no, there's no regulation that, pro, you know, that provides for you sending somebody to one of these fixes well, I take I thought, that back. I, I take that, that too. back. <laughs> if I mean, we're going to get into the weeds here. If you're using one of those as a vector to final, which is mm. how you would be using it, you would have to because, uh, but you it would have to be provided that the intercept is is thirty degrees or less and you're joining the final at least three miles outside the final approach fix on an RNAV. Right. Which There's no it? exceptions to that. There's no, hey, the weather's great, so I can go at a mile on an RNAV. It is no ifs, ands, or buts, three miles from the final approach fix if you're vectoring to final. Um, but Agreed. As, I mean, yeah. All right, I'll, I'll, I'm going to back it up and take a vanilla normal RNAV approach with a T-fix. It's, okay. it's much less work for the controller. And oh, it's, right. It, okay. I see. For us saying. to send you to an initial approach fix and clear for the approach with an altitude. It's one transmission and the airplane or the pilot following the course is going to fly the approach and we're not vectoring to final. The, the approach is doing that for you. It'll provide you with enough lead in time to intercept final from the correct side of the base you were on. And it's, there's, less work it's it's very easy for us to do that mm -hmm. as opposed to vectors to final i'm going to base you i'm going to give you the the turn on and then i'm going to issue you a clearance which is the same thing as an ils we do that all day long but it's more work it's several more transmissions and it's more focus on that on that airplane so if you are the only plane in the sky vector to final and maybe at this airport is perfectly fine and they could probably accommodate it but if they're trying to jam you in, which in our back and forth exchange is what it sounded like. So I think this is what's happening that's causing this question. You were told direct to bub, which is an initial approach fix. And at some point, the controller decided to cut the corner and go to, hey, we're going to give you vectors to final. Then goes back and says clear direct grove, which is inside of the intermediate fix which is now gone. It's not on your screen anymore because you got a vector. You thought you were going to get a vector to final. As soon as you tell your FMS, I'm getting a vector to final, all those fixes prior to the final approach fix, poof, they're gone. 
<laughs> they disappear. So now the controller is basically using Grove to get you to intercept final, but doesn't realize that that's gone. It's no longer on your screen. You're going to have to go back out, load up the whole approach so that you can see Grove again, activate it, and start the approach from there, which I think is part of the 11 button pushes. A pain in the butt when you're in a descent trying to configure the airplane for landing. And as you said, talking to air traffic, et cetera, et cetera. So what the controller should be doing, in my humble opinion, is sticking with the original. Either give them an initial approach fix, clear them fit approach, and leave them alone, or actually give them vectors to final because you told them you were going to, mm -hmm. and never go back and give them a fixed name. That shouldn't be happening. Right. I... I could not agree more. I could not agree more. If so, you, if you as a controller say, you know, fly heading two four zero vectors to final approach course. As the pilot, I'm going to wipe out all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. I get final approach fix and a big line that goes out from that. You know, extending it into forever. That, I'm then expecting a turn to join. And then maybe even you go so far as to turn me on base, turn your base. Mm -hmm. And then on the base somewhere you say, clear direct to this fix. What? Yeah. In this example, Grove. And it would be right. like, why are you doing that? We yeah, were one well, turn away. Grove. I don't have that anymore. <laughs> we were one turn away from you clearing me for this approach, giving me a normal turn on. And you went back to square one. I can't do that. It's yeah. Oh, I had a trainee do that to a, a jet going into Coat Factory one time. And you could tell the pilot was so mad. The mm. weather was bad. They had already had to be vectored way out of the way because we were waiting on a cancellation or something. And he's on the base expecting to turn in about two miles, probably. Oh, no. I know. What and you're the controller say. says, clear direct to the fix. Mm. And the guy says, Are you kidding me? He goes, yeah, that that's going to take us a minute. We're going to go through final. You know, he was very, very upset. You could tell. And mm. I, <laughs> I was upset. I was probably more upset than he was. I said, D disregard that. Turn left heading, whatever. You're clear for the approach. Mm -hmm. He said, oh, thank you. <laughs> but, yeah, this is a misunderstanding. This is a, this is a controller. These, this is controllers not understanding what workload they are putting on pilots in a very short period of time or the implications of saying vectors to final right and what that means and what you've you've said goodbye to you've said goodbye to all of those fixes and i'm right. relying on you to get me on to final now just like an ils yeah what would be much more helpful is if if you know that you're going to clear them to grove mm -hmm. eventually is to say, um, you know, once you turn them off the course or whatever you whatever turn you gave them, fly heading, you know, fly heading um, two five zero. Expect direct Grove in two miles. Now instead of wiping out all those points, I could just plus up. I could just mm -hmm. sequence up to Grove. Provided you haven't already told your FMS that you're going to get vectors to final. That's correct. Right. So, so if the controller, what I'm saying is if the controller knows that they're going to do that mm -hmm. prior to saying expect vectors to final. So usually if let's say an aircraft is direct to bo blob, bub, what is it? Bub. bub. Yeah. You've got an aircraft going direct to bub. They're not on a vector. As soon as you turn them, you have to provide a reason for the turn. Okay. When if you at this point said this is vectors to final, you need to immediately follow that with expect to direct grove in four miles or whatever mm. you're gonna do. Or just saying. don't say vectors to final at all. I agree with that part, yes. Flighting two five zero expect grove in four miles. Bingo. Done. Don't say the magical words vectors to final because the pilots will clean up the box and it will be gone. Okay, I agree with everything you just said. But I would ask that controller, why are you going to do that when all you have to do is put them on that heading, say vectors to final, and then wait the requisite two or three more miles before you can give them a turn on? Why go back and give them Grove? It's it's a little bit easier, and it cuts a little bit of phraseology out, but you've yeah. already put them on a, on a vector. 
stick with it. Finish it. Yeah. Just finish it. I think the confusion is now without saying anything too disparaging about the people who write the 7110, but I pulled up a little blurb in here. And one of your questions, Darth Pilot, was, is there a rule that allows this? And there is. It's below the one that says we must begin at an initial approach fix or an intermediate fix if there is no initial approach fix. It does say that. Okay. Then below, at number five, radar facilities may clear an aircraft to any fix three nautical miles or more prior to the final approach fix along the final approach course at an intercept angle not greater than 30 degrees. So right. it allows them the ability to do in this example, clear them to Grove after they've been on a heading. But I don't I'm I'm confident that the controllers don't realize that Grove is no longer displayed. It's not an option for you to select direct to anymore, and it's a waste of breath. They should just say, I've already committed. I'm inside of Bub. I'm on a heading. Just give them one more. It's a two fifty in this case, ish. Clear them for the approach and be done with it. That's what right. they should be doing. Right. That's all that initial vector was for, is to get you inside of that 30-degree swath Mm -hmm. to the final approach course. And once you're in there, once you're in that little cone, that magical 60-degree cone from Grove, Mm -hmm. they're just going to go direct to the fix. I would even bet that they Which, like I said, is not... They can do that. The breakdown is we're not communicating that that's what's going to happen. Mm. that's the disconnect. So, you know, and and I know this has come, this has been pushed down. I've sat through briefings on this classes on the computer. Hey, you're, you're messing up the, the FMS at a very, you know, critical point in the flight. Um, It's requiring a high workload of the pilots to do this at the last minute. But, it's one of, you know, a hundred of them that you, that you have to sit through a year and right. it just gets washed out. Yes. There's not enough attention put on something that for your, for the pilot side, this is a big deal. This happens to you every day. It's frustrating for controllers. Mm, I'll say this nicely. If we get away with it once, there's an assumption that it's correct and everyone else can do it too. Exactly. I, pilot you know, one didn't complain. I'm going to do it forever. Right. I think, I don't know. I'm going to get in trouble for saying this. Say it. <laughs> <laughs> you need to complain. If you're the pilot and this is happening to you consistently, especially at the same facility, don't do it on frequency, but get a phone number, call the building and say, mm-hmm. hey, this is messed up. We we can't do this. We had a problem uh, very similar to this, not quite the same, but when RNAV approaches first started to come into use and we got the capability to do them in the helicopter, there was a lot of confusion about how it could work and how it could not work. And <clears throat> we had an approach control clearing us for an approach from a very weird angle in a very mm. bad spot. Mm. And on a check ride, it's really putting the student or the, the, um, you know, the person getting the ride in a bad position. Mm-hmm. because it wasn't legal and it it took us calling them and having a little you know sit down conference call and going hey <clears throat> you know this is how we're interpreting this and this is what it's doing to us on our end it's very very difficult to make this happen in the FMS um and we don't feel we feel that it's not legal now in this case this this approach clearance might be legal but it's highly inconvenient and right. the workload that it's putting on the pilots during the you know, the final phase of flight during the approach phase of the flight, it's really unacceptable. It's unacceptable. Especially I, if the weather's bad or, you know, there's other stuff going on in the cockpit that, you know, it's a, just a very busy time. I can see why the controller would do this. It's cutting a corner and they may be jamming you in front of somebody else sequence wise. Either I turn you now or you don't, but they need to realize they've committed to a vector and they should just stick to it at that point. It's what we talked about today is, pretty advanced for most controllers knowledge of RNAV approaches and they're not going to want to hear past the first sentence. So I'll go back to the basics. If there's any controllers listening that are confused, either give them an initial approach fix and stick with it or tell them they're getting vectors to final and give them vectors to final, just like you would on an ILS 
and don't go back to those approach fix names out outside the final approach fix. Yep. And for the pilots that it's happening to, you're going to have to complain about it. Yep. They're not going to, it won't stop Mm -mm. because we're not reaching controllers. Mm -mm. We're reaching you guys on the flying side. That's the most of the audience here. It's not controllers. Mm. And so they're not going to get the message unless it's from you. You've got to tell them, hey, this, no, we can't do that. You really want to throw a wrench in their plan when they say clear direct to whatever, say, no, we're unable. Yeah. We need a, we need a heading. Yeah. We need a heading and we need a vector to final. That might actually clear it up pretty quick. Okay. Yeah. I've already wasted <laughs> my voice telling you something and it's going to make them think about it for a second somebody should rewind and say i wonder why i couldn't do that well <laughs> you told them vectors to final and that you know but i'm not sure we've ever been taught that in any sort of formal environment here this, you don't think so if you like you said if we did it was a brief that you know here's a piece of paper go sit down and watch this and we're clicking through and you know the time spent to actually understand it is not there no and, and appreciate what we're doing for the pilots and what we're this controller may think, oh, look, I'm giving them a shortcut. What's the big deal? Yeah, it's a shortcut, but you gotta you got to follow through with the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, the other question you had, why don't we put it on the ATIS on telling them how to join the approach? It's actually a pretty good idea. I've, I've kind of related. I thought on the FedEx nights, why aren't we advertising these RNAV approaches? It would cut down on our workload so much. Yeah. They can, they can all do it. The minimum is as good as the ILS. Clear, yeah. You clear clear to a fix, yeah. cleared for the approach. I would. Done. That's one transmission per pilot versus too many <laughs> descents, turns. Yeah. Um, if we put that on there, I think it would probably make the national news. Why are they advertising our nav approaches instead of ILSs? If the weather were below, I'm just going to throw a number out, a thousand feet. But the minimums are almost the same now on the LPV. So yeah, uh, I think it. You know, in the tower we advertise, we put the ATIS out there. It depends on the controller, and we don't, we aren't in the habit from a tower perspective telling controllers downstairs how they're going to do their job that day. So it may be informative to put it on there. Hey, expect this fix for this approach. That doesn't mean the downstairs is going to do it, you know, even half the time. So it might be pointless to put it on there. Yeah. And, and that's the other point about the ATIS is, you know, at the time that might be the controller's needs for you to go to, to mm-hmm. that random fix. But the next guy, that's not going to work because of where he's at, you know, the angle that he's at or whatever. Um, so it, it could just be situationally dependent. Like, yeah, we could advertise, Hey, expect to go to humbug or whatever that stinking thing is. Bub. <laughs> Bub. <laughs> expect to go to Bub or expect to go to, what was the H one? Wasn't there an H or uh, uh, down the line that wasn't an, uh, yeah, an it's, initial it's approach fix or intermediate Grove. fix? Grove. Grove. Expect to go to Grove, you know, for this approach. So then the pilots have that set up, and then the controller says, oh, clear direct bub. And now you've already passed it in the approach, and now you got to reload the stupid thing. So, <laughs> <laughs> Right. Oh, that ADA said we're going here. Yeah. Right. I, so I then you're going to tie a controller down to, oh, I can only do it this one way because the ADA said that. Or now they've got to tell the pilot, oh, no, this isn't going to work. Expect this now. You know, and I, I just think it would be, if you could do it to every plane, great. If not, now somebody else is going to be upset. Mm-hmm. Oh, you told us to expect, you know. Uh, this one last thing I have mentioned on this. We get this a lot. Pilots will request a fix when they get into the airspace. And it, from a pilot perspective, I understand why they're asking for it. Some controllers don't get it, but it does clear up a lot of their workload. They can put the fix in, activate the approach from there, and I don't touch them again. That's it. I gave it to you. I'm done. Uh, at Coat Factory, the cackle, for, cackle fix is one that we commonly use. We give them that all the time. They'll ask for it when they come into the airspace. Some of the FedEx pilots are asking for this weird fix on the ILS that's on the chart. It's not really an ATC fix. It's one of those five-letter fixes. Fine. Give it to them. You're going to get established on the localizer, but I know the results may vary, and you and I talked about this, Darth Pilot. Asking for that approach, If in this example, ask for Bub, stick with it, say we'd like the clearance from Bub, 
you know, if they try to take you off of it, hey, we're already set up for Bub. Is it all right if we do the approach from there? You're probably not going to get a lot of pushback unless it's a real tight sequence issue where they, they have to. Then it you're telling them, nope, I don't want your shortcut. I just, I just want to do this. Just just let, right. just let me stay on this, okay? <clears throat> right, right. And if you file Bub, we aren't going to see that as the approach control. We're just going to see that you're landing at, in this case, Oakland. That Bub fix is gone. We don't see that anymore. So that's why you mentioned that you filed it sometimes. That really won't have an effect on the terminal controller seeing it. So, can we just say something about shortcuts too? Oh God! Let's all be honest about shortcuts. Okay, <laughs> some of these shortcuts are really not saving anybody anything. No, we're talking like 0. 0.5 miles. Mm-hmm. And come on, when you're doing 250 knots, what is that saving you? Ten mm-hmm. seconds? I mean. Right. Mm-hmm. It's really not that big of a deal. Now, if I saved you, if I cut you, you know, a shortcut that saved you 50 miles, that's different. But like the biggest shortcut I could ever cut anybody in our entire airspace might save them five miles, maybe. Mm-hmm. Right. Maybe. And in a Skyhawk, <laughs> it's two and a half minutes. Is it really that big? Is it really that important? At the expense of a bunch of obtuse angles, we're going to have to be more creative with vectors later on. Just don't put me on my soapbox. Yeah. You and I are the same on that one. Okay. Just stick with normal pattern legs, please. I mean, you know, we've been, I've been on these huge cross countries and you're on a, uh, in the King air and you're on, you know, some airway or something that they've given you. And then you look at direct and you look down, well, if we went direct, we'd save, let's see, two minutes. Two minutes on a four-hour flight? Like, give me a break. I don't really care. You know, it's not <laughs> big of a deal. It's not worth asking for. It's not worth, you know, the coordination required to do it. Like, eh, just forget it. All right. Can we move uh, on? I think we I think we got plenty of soapbox time there. I do not have the chat room window up. I'm sure it's active at this point. We'll hit that at the end. Thank you, Darth Pilot, for sending that in. Hopefully we answered the questions and didn't get too deep into the weeds. Mm. We'll move on. All right. Feedback time. Feedback. All right, number one is getting skipped. If we have time, we're going back to it. I'm going to start with number two. How's that? Oh, uh, okay. All right. From Patreon, Echo Charlie. Good morning, guys. Echo Charlie from the middle of the Metroplex and the amazing Opposing Bases chat room. Longtime listener, first time caller, habitual liar. <laughs> All right, when we're flying from non-towered airports, the vast majority of departure and center controllers are happy to give us a hold for release clearance, which gives us plenty of time to get everything in the airplane programmed, our passengers loaded up, and remember that one of us still has the rental car key in our pockets. <laughs> How many times have you taken off with that in your pocket? Man. Mm. We taxi the runway, give departure a call, and they give us a four or five minute void time. It works like a charm. We do that in our space too. We mm-hmm. often have airplanes call on the ground. We say hold for release. I usually start the transmission with that so there's no misunderstanding. <laughs> Hold for release, yeah. clear right. to the <laughs> Yeah. As soon as you <laughs> as soon as you finish reading the clearance. They, they just, just unkey and they're gone. <laughs> <laughs> Take off power set. Off we go. Yeah. All right. So I'm not gonna read your whole clearance. They gave you the clearance on the ground. You went through what you normally get. You're expecting to get a hold for release. And you told them our passengers aren't here yet. I'm just looking for a hold of release clearance so I can get everything programmed. I can give you a call when we're number one for departure. The controller said, you mean you're not ready to go? Affirmative. It takes a little bit of time to get everything up and running. We should be ready to go in about 30 minutes. <sighs> November 123 Alpha Bravo. IFR clearance canceled. Just give me a call when you're ready to go. I don't need that much time to get you out of that airport. What? I know. That's exactly what I said. I had to read this a couple times. Oh, my gosh. 
Echo Charlie says, I understand that. I'm just asking for a little bit of time so I don't have to deal with a reroute shortly after takeoff. Just give me a call when you're ready to go. The controller said, I'm not sure how he made the dial tone transmit over the radio, but there it was. (laughs) He hung up on you. (laughs) We got everybody loaded up, taxied out, and called them when we were number one. We got the exact same clearances earlier with the same squawk, and everything worked out fine. We go into this airport every three or four months, and it's always a hassle to get a hold for release clearance. Do you guys have any insight on why this is the case? See ya, Echo Charlie. I have no idea. I went and reread the rule. I tried to figure out if there's some sort of nuance that maybe we just don't understand at our airspace. Why are we doing it? In other words, am I doing something wrong? And no, it is 100% normal, endorsed, legal, regular practice to give a hold for release off a non-towered airport. And when we do say you're ready to go, if we have to block for airspace or keep overflights away, it's for a couple minutes. You know, we may give them 10 minutes. I've never given anybody more than 10 or 15 minutes, but it's dynamic. It depends on the traffic, but I cannot think of a good reason why that controller didn't do that. There's a strip marking we even put down. So if I was relieved, say I gave the clearance, I check a box that says the clearance was issued. I also put down the void, uh, void time if you were released, but oftentimes someone will write HFR hold for release on there. So there's no confusion. This airplane has their clearance but they're not going to just come off the ground at any time. They're going to call back again. It's totally normal. I don't know why that controller did that. Well, I do. They don't know the rule. I mean, (laughs) how is that possible? (laughs) I don't know. I mean, we're so inundated with, you know, satellite airport ops. It would be a huge pain. Think about at a regular towered airport. Oh no, sir. No, we can't read your clearance Mm -mm. until you're down there at the end of the runway, ready to go. That's ridiculous. Mm. Yeah. Guys call for their clearance like an hour early sometimes. Yeah. Hey, we're mm-hmm. waiting on passengers. We'll just go ahead and get our clearance. No, no, sorry. No. Uh-uh. no can't do that. Mm-mm. Nope. You'll you might just there. take off. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, maybe yeah, that maybe that's the case where they don't know the rule, but I think there's something else going on that we just don't understand. There, there has to be a better reason than I just don't know that I could do that. How have they gotten through their training and not heard hold for release it's in the book i know it's in the book (laughs) (laughs) Uh, so here's my suggestion i would call is it in non-radar operations maybe that's why no it's in chapter mm, i don't know which chapter it was no it's not i don't think it is it's not non-radar okay i mean that technically is a non-radar Function because you're, you know, but all right. My suggestion is find a phone number to call that's not the RCO or GCO and get a supervisor on the phone and tell them exactly what you asked us. Hey, I get hold for release everywhere in the NAS except yeah. here. Is there some reason you guys can't do that? We're not going to take off, we just want to get it all typed in and ready to go. We'll call you when we're number one at the end of the runway, like we do everywhere else. Yeah, and yes. Yeah, so- and the reason that we're calling now is so that if you have a reroute, we're not doing that mm-hmm. with the plane running at the end of the runway with passengers on board. Yeah. Hmm. Mm. It's like, it's almost like efficiency or something. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Echo Charlie. You want number three? <laughs> I vaguely remember that word being at the beginning of the 7110. <laughs> <laughs> number three. <laughs> Patron, Romeo Whiskey. Hey, guys, here's my solo story. Check ride story will follow shortly. I would have done audio, but I'm listening to 179 live as I type. Sorry, AG, <laughs> if you get this one. Oh, dang it. <laughs> dang it. Uh, I soloed on April 18th. Okay. Nope. Oh, I thought we would get the... Oh, this, this we've done this. Uh, we've done the cheering for him. This is the, finally the oh. solo story. We've, we've oh. celebrated this. Okay. I'm very sorry. <laughs> one month. <laughs> one month and a day later. One month and a day later, I was taking my check ride. Here's how it happened. Some background. Due, <laughs> due to delays. I'm getting my medical. I needed a uh, special issuance. I had accumulated 40 hours without soloing. All of my training requirements were complete, including night and cross country. For various personal reasons, I stopped flying after September 2020. 
Go forward to April 2021, and I was ready to finish my private. I scheduled an initial training flight with my instructor to start the process and getting back to being solo ready. The morning of April 18th was a beautiful calm wind morning just prior to pulling the plane out. My instructor and I were talking about our plan for the flight. He made a comment that this would be the perfect weather for you to solo in. You'll probably end up having a nasty crosswind, though. I haven't asked him yet if he knew I would solo that morning. Uh, we take off and do some normal private pilot maneuvers in the practice area, then come back to the airport for some pattern work after the third or fourth landing. As we're departing, my instructor says, if you can show me three or four more landings like that one, what do you say to going up on your own? I was certainly a bit surprised, if not pleasantly surprised. Uh, we had a quick discussion about whether or not that was a good idea and agreed that I would go ahead and solo. After going inside for a bit to get all the endorsements from my CFI, I went back out and soloed for 0.6 hours in the pattern. On my first attempt at landing, I went around because I was just too fast and floating due to forgetting my second notch of flaps. Uh, for normal landings, my club teaches 20 degrees versus full flaps in the 172. I did three more laps in the pattern, two of them touch and goes and one full stop. Other than <laughs> one excessively wide pattern, there was nothing out of the ordinary. As I had suspected for a while, my solo was pretty anticlimactic, other than being alone in the plane. That said, after my final pattern, and as I was taxiing back, I started laughing uncontrollably with excitement. <laughs> 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 Romeo Whiskey from the birthplace of Aviation City. Cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I've had that feeling before. <laughs> This is a circumstances were slightly different, but <laughs> yes, <laughs> there was a lot of laughing. Uh, Souls are fun. I like that story. Yeah. <clears throat> and yeah. yours was unique that you soloed on day one and then on day two did your check ride because you got a lot of your training done during a wait for a medical. So really interesting story. Yeah, that is pretty unique. Yeah. Cool. All right, number four from Tangle Mike, Romeo Hotel and Alpha Golf. First, I'd like to thank you for the podcast. As an instructor getting close to making the jump to the airlines, I still learn something new from every episode. I instruct out of a busy parallel runway delta beneath the Motor City Bravo with a healthy constituency of both corporate and GA aircraft. I'd like to pat myself on the back for saying that word. It's harder to say than it is it to is. read. It, it is uh, <laughs> intimidating. There is never a dull moment at this field while in the pattern tower often informs us of traffic on the opposing base. Unfortunately, using different phraseology, the volume of traffic makes sending students solo a uniquely apprehensive experience. One of my students in the middle of their initial solo was given the following dreaded transmission. Warrior 1234 changed to my frequency. We're going dual towers. Despite my partial heart attack and visions of the words pilot deviation, and I have a number for you to copy, <laughs> my student handled it flawlessly without any issue, as this scenario is fairly common and we discuss it prior to solo. But I'm curious, how common is it for airports to go to two frequencies, dual towers? Who makes that decision? Is it based on the number of aircraft or the tower's discretion? Thanks, Tangle Mike. All right, we had the thought at one point in our facility that we were going to have two towers, frequencies. It's the same tower but two frequencies. There's a space on the other side of the tower where we could have done that, but the traffic never really came to fruition. Maybe it will in 2050, um, but <laughs> workload. If a facility is set up for parallel runways, most of the time you'll see it, where one control will have, uh, the, you know, let's just say the right runway, the other one will have the left runway, and they work within their respective sides of the airport. It's, it's workload driven. As traffic picks up and departures and arrivals start appearing on both runways, Someone in charge makes the decision to say, all right, it's too much for one. We're going to split it, and it could be for a departure bank or a flight school's active. It could be a number of things. Um, but somebody makes the decision, open up that other tower frequency, and that's what you're hearing. I would argue that I would feel more comfortable with my student being on a dual frequency than the other way around. I think you're more prone to have congested frequency in a busier controller with one working two runways and forget about your student maybe for a couple of seconds, like your attention is going to be drawn to two different pieces of pavement. That's my point. If they're split, 
I would feel more comfortable with my student in that situation. Now they have a dedicated controller to the runway they're on and they're going to get more exclusive service from that one controller. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So don't dread it. That's good. I mean, you know, I can understand that the, in the changeover, there might be, Mm -hmm. you know, problem with getting the frequency in or, you know, whatever. There's maybe some confusion on the student's part, but, um, once they're, you know, once they're over there, yeah, it's a much better scenario. Yeah. And they should be able to pick out their call sign, get less mixed up in the mix of traffic. We'll put it that way. Less chance for wake turbulence issues with departures in front of them. They might be doing it like we do. Put the little guys on the runway over there for touch and goes. We could have three or four in the pattern. And then we'll just use the other runway for the jets, arrivals, and departures. Keeps everybody separated by speed, performance, and, you know, all that. Yeah. So, cool. All right. You want the next one? Number five from Julia Charlie. Hey, OB team. I have some timely feedback regarding military solos and pilot training. Unfortunately, I can only talk to the Air Force side, but I know a few listeners may be interested since we do things a little differently than the normal FAA private pilot progression. As you talked about, the helico- helicopter community will do the same as the Army conducting the... Conducting Brolos? Brolo, Brolos? Brolos? <laughs> Brolos? <clears throat> B-R-O space L-O-O apostrophe like a, S. A solo, but you're with somebody else? <laughs> oh, okay. Brolos. Brolo, yeah, Brolos, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. That's some stinking Air Force stuff. Where it... <laughs> We will do the same as the Army conducting brolos where it is you and another student beating up the pattern and later going cross country. On the Mm. fixed wing world, you'll do a few solos out to the MOA and come back to the pattern. Where it gets fun and interesting as an instructor is the formation solo in T6s and T38s where you have a student in your jet and another student that is solo in the other obviously this can be very rewarding for everyone but also gets rapidly sketch at times with two students flying near one another with you as the instructor reminding them not to hit each other (laughs) that is very (laughs) important uh unfortunately the t1 the beach jet students don't get to do uh brolos anymore sad face moving beyond basic pilot training if your plane only has one seat, then you then you'll go up with an instructor on your wing. Thank you for the awesome podcast, and I hope now your listeners have lots of useless trivia regarding military flight training. <laughs> you know, I I don't know the current status of uh, Brolos for Army mm. helicopter training. Mm. Um, I mean the problem, not really a problem, but the requirement is that the army says all of these airplanes are two pilot airplanes. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to solo them. I mean, the King air is probably about the only one that you actually could fly single pilot safely. The Chinook, there's too many buttons and stuff that are important that you can't reach from Mm -hmm. (laughs) one seat. It's just, it would be a really bad idea. Could you do it? Yeah. I'd still want another body up there that could reach stuff. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, the small helicopters, obviously, uh, jet ranger, um, which they're phasing out if they're not completely gone already for initial, you could do that. They're made to be flown single pilot. Mm -hmm. Um, but I just don't, I really don't think it's that great of an idea. You got these guys that are, you know, 20 hours or less in a helicopter. Mm -hmm. They really don't have any business flying it around by themselves. (laughs) (laughs) So... (laughs) <laughs> I, I think it's still I think it's a good policy. The bro low. I've never heard that before, but leave it to the Air Force to make up some ridiculous name. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the beach jet, I cannot imagine flying it solo pilot. There are it's a button issue too, and for in terms of being able to reach, you can get there. It's not as convenient. Uh you may have to get out of your seatbelt to get to certain things. Um, yeah, it's so not designed for single yeah. pilot. It can be certainly be operated by one if something happened, but it's it would be a lot in terms of physically getting to all the things you need to get to in certain cases. Yeah. So. Hmm. Cool. We were talking about that last night. You were talking about single pilot, dual pilot. 
Yes. Know, how the, the GA community is very single pilot oriented, um, which is very different than the way once you left GA and started the airlines, it is a crew, you know, mm-hmm. this is a crew function. You should not be over there by yourself doing everything. Mm-hmm. It's not the intent of it. I still say single pilot IFR, even if the weather's great, is probably the hardest for a pilot to get used to. And yeah. those pilots earn their earn their pay hour by hour if you're by oh, yourself. Yeah. That's <clears throat> tough work. So, mm-hmm. All right, number six. Why did I turn this screen off from Patreon? Tango Bravo. Hi, gents. I have a question about IFR routing. I subscribe to IFR Magazine, for which controllers contribute contribute a plethora of content a july 2019 article discussed ifr route planning instead of filing gps direct to destination when you are slant golf the article referenced using one or two fixes in each center's airspace you pass through per the aim can you guys comment on the reason for this how does this impact controllers all right i'm only going to touch on this for a second for a for a pilot to know what fixes are in each center's airspace would take a considerable amount of homework uh, we have said that filing direct from point A to point B in most places east of the Mississippi is not going to yield you a direct route. If you go anywhere near a Bravo, which there are plenty of, you're likely going to get rerouted. Um, the only thing I could think of, and I did read that portion of the aim last night, it also says to file direct from field to field too. It sort of doesn't make sense to me. But if you pull up fixes uh, for, for handoffs and for knowledge of the controller that you've just entered their airspace, we don't know where all these fixes are. If you have a fix that's 200 miles away, I have no idea where that is. It would Correct. be great if you had a fix that was somewhere familiar to us. And if you started deviating, we'll give you back to that. We know which direction you're going. But I think it's more of an automation issue and keeping the controllers in on the same page of where where is this guy going? That's it. But yeah. for I, you I, to know where those fixes are would be, yeah, tough. Well... If you're talking about just in the center's airspace, mm-hmm. those boundaries are on the. Oh, IFR that's true. Chart. They are on yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. So the center boundaries are on the IFR chart, and plopping a couple fixes in each one wouldn't be that difficult. Are the controllers going to know where that is? No, probably not, especially if it's two centers away. Um, but like you said, it's an automation thing. A lot of the times, if there's if you're filed direct and you're going across the center boundary, this because we get caught in this all the time, and you try to make an amendment mm-hmm. to it, it will tell you flight does not enter center's airspace, and it won't let you do anything. Um, and I feel like if it if it had a point in there already, mm-hmm. it would it would fix that problem. I could be wrong, um, but the guys typically that file you know, a traditional sort of route on a Victor airway and a bunch of fixes, you know, those are the flight plans we don't have problems with. Usually everything goes perfectly with Mm -hmm. those. And if you need to make amendment, it's not a problem. It's the ones that are direct and they're going through, you know, from one center to the next and it gets messed up. Not, not all of them, but some, some of them, especially from us going eastbound tend to have all of these problems with automation. Um, so I think that's probably the primary reason. I don't know. Yeah. If you do have the time to do the research and figure out where the fixes are, it does get you plugged into the flight plan and seeing where your route flies. So if you do get a random reroute, which you are probably going to get on the East coast, at least you have some idea, you know, don't just take off blindly thinking you're going to get direct. We've said it a million times. That's not likely you're going to get a reroute somewhere yeah. to go around or underneath somewhere. Bravo is going to be a big factor in that. So if you beforehand have an idea of where these places are in space or nearby VORs, you're going to be better off when it comes to that reroute, in my opinion. Agree. All right. You want to get number seven? Number seven from patron Romeo November. Howdy, guys. Romeo November here. Again, from the great state of dude, where's my electricity? And I'm... (laughs) Using flight following and getting transferred to the next controller, oftentimes the current controller will say contact departure on one three four or one three three point four five. But when I call them up and say departure, Skyline three four five, uh, flight level two three zero. Wow, 
That's wow. impressive. The person yeah. will say, <laughs> Skyline one, two, three, four, five, approach, local altimeter, two, nine, or nine, or two. Did I just insult the approach controller by calling them departure? Is one more prestigious than the other? <laughs> Why the difference? Keep up the great work, Romeo November. <laughs> this is a question we've had uh, that people <laughs> have asked before. Um, it depends. Some places that is a separate controller. Mm-hmm. Departure is a separate controller than approach. Um, usually, if I'm talking to a departure, I say departure. If I'm talking to an arrival or an or- overflight, I say approach. Um, Which is confusing, by the way, because we combine a lot. Yeah. And on the mid, we're combined to everything. For a small period of time, it's ground, clearance, tower, departure, arrival, final. Yes. So you sort of have this, there's a pause. I know I'm guilty of it. When you check in, I'll just said goodbye to, or said, you know, radar contact to a departure, try departure, radar contact, climb, maintain. And then the next arrival comes in and you're not departure to them. That You're not insulting anybody, but the controller is changing their role and their title based on who's calling them. It gets confusing for me. I have a small brain. I have to think when I look at the strip and who am I talking to, but I don't, to answer your question about the insult, I don't think it's an insult. Now no. there, there may be some facilities where one is easier than the other. And, mm. but <laughs> if you got, if you're on the right frequency, don't worry about what they're calling themselves. If you're on the wrong frequency, they're going to say, Hey, you're on departure. You need to talk to arrival because you're an arrival and they gave you the wrong frequency and maybe they didn't realize we split and right. You know, right. But Here's you're not pro insulting tip. anybody. <laughs> Here's a pro tip. <laughs> Don't say approach or departure. Just say the name of the facility mm. when you mm-hmm. check in. Hey, triad, it's November one, two, three. Then you can't really be wrong. It's just going to be. Or approach. Approach is general. That's pretty general, yeah. Yeah, because we're all in the approach facility. I don't... Yeah. And if you don't know the name of the facility, <laughs> then you can just say approach. I would say, if you had to say one or the other, just say approach. Mm-hmm. Um, if you don't know if it's departure or approach and, and that matters, just say the name of the facility. Mm-hmm. Oh, that happens at altitude for me when I'm in, all, in the jet. All the time. They say contact <laughs> Mimimim <Mimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimimim
It's, this doesn't have anything to do with heavies. It's just based on engines. Category 1 airplanes are less than 12,500 pounds with one engine. Category 2, same weight restriction, less than 12,500 with two engines. And Category 3 is everything else. Jets, small pluses. A Pilatus is a small plus. Yeah, turbo uh, turbo props right. are going to be Cat 3s. I may have misspoke. Is a Pilatus a small plus? Are they over 12,500? I don't know. Anyway. If a, two Category 1s are arriving, they can be 3,000 feet apart, and it's okay. We do have suitable landmarks. We have runway markers on the runway. We can see how much distance they've taken up. We have a center. We have a middle of our uh, GA runway is exactly 4,500 feet to the, to the taxiway. So if we had a Category 2, which is a twin, behind a Category 1, and the Category 1 had passed that 4,500-foot mark, you could have them both on the runway. That's not that common. We don't see that a lot here. But at certain airports, that happens all the time. Mm-hmm. Departures, unless there's a jet involved or Cat Three, you can have one rolling down the runway. As long as they get to the three thousand feet, you can clear the other one. They can both be rolling down the runway. The first one doesn't have to be airborne yet, unless you have a jet. They have to be six thousand and airborne. Did I say that incorrectly? Um, let's see. I don't Two know. Cat ones. I thought the three thousand. I thought you still had to have. Airborne. Mm. We'll have to get back to you on that one. Okay. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, we just don't use that. We just don't use it that often. Here's why it doesn't happen that often. In that, in Cat One case, three thousand feet is a long roll for a Cat One. They're usually airborne by then. That's so true. We have our distance, and they're airborne. Right now, yeah, jets in the summertime. 6,000 feet is not always enough runway, so they might not be airborne for seven, eight thousand 8,000 feet down the runway. So you have to be careful with applying that rule. What that means is I can launch a jet, clear them for takeoff, and when they're 6,000 feet and airborne, both of those criteria have to be met. The next airplane can be rolled for departure behind that Category 3 airplane. Right. Now, if you get too jumpy and get out there in front of it too fast or winter mode in your head and you clear that second guy for takeoff, if it's hot, you're gonna you're gonna end up having a separation issue because there's no way that jet's gonna get off in six thousand feet. It's not gonna happen. Right. So to answer right. your question, yes, you can have two airplanes on the runway at the same time. The rules get confusing. It does matter on their weight and what category they are. Um, this the most common application if we did have one in our airspace was arrival to arrival, a little guy behind a little guy. Though it's number two thinks that you can't have that first one on there and they'll go around or they'll clarify, just verify we're cleared to land. And there's been some feedback we got in the past where the controllers are reiterating on the frequency. It is legal for me to have you both on the runway. Number two, you are cleared to land. Please put it down on the runway. Do yes. it. <laughs> Don't go around. Whereas in pilot training, I didn't know that till I became a controller. I would have right. thought that that first airplane had to be turning off the runway. Not the case. You won't see that a lot in the triad. Right. But there are airports in the NAS where you're going to see that all the time. If the second plane is a jet and the first one is a Skyhawk, you don't get to do that. Correct. They have to be off the runway. <laughs> they have to be off the runway. Yes. Yeah, anytime there's a jet, that's a category three because they're not less than they're they they're not less than twelve five and they're not propeller driven airplanes. They they have to be the runway is Separation is different, either airborne for the departure and 6,000 feet or off of the runway for both parties. A jet to jet, jet behind a prop, prop behind a jet. The jet has to be off the runway. Jets get a clear runway. Always. Yeah. Right. And the plane that's, let's say you launched a Skyhawk in front of a jet, uh, two departures, the Skyhawk must be turned. Mm Mm-hmm. If he's still over the runway, must be turning off away from the runway mm-hmm. before that jet starts his starts his roll. Because you're launching a bullet behind him and you right. need him out he's of going the to way. Rapidly <laughs> catch him. <laughs> yeah. All right. I know I went over that quickly. Hopefully that cleared that up a little bit. But if you honestly, if you're not in a controlling environment where you have to apply this, it's it's not gonna make a lot of sense. At Air Venture, you mentioned that. They have all sorts of funny rules for air venture. They're landing th- two or three airplanes at a time on a surface with dots. That's notumed out and proceduralized and definitely unique. That's not normal. 
So, yeah. Speaking of which, I think Mike and I are going to work on a Notum episode. We'll go over the differences this year. I'd like to do that in the next couple of weeks, like we did last year on the Notum. I guess that is an announcement. Okay. Mike doesn't know it yet, but Mike, I want to do the Notum again. <laughs> Mike. <laughs> Uh, we do not have a new question of the week. We skipped number one. It's audio all played on the next episode. If you want to find a way to keep your headset clean of dust and funk, check out atcsax.com and pilotsax.com. You find a nice little bag. You can put your initials on to keep your headset nice and clean and cozy while you're not using it. AG? Mm-hmm. Anything to I, add? I, I don't. All right, this episode will come out on the 12th range of July. We're recording it early. We have feedback up to June 9th. Prior to that date, right on the show, or respond via email. If we missed yours, let us know. Closing out, episode 185 of Opposing Bases Air Traffic Talk, Romeo Hotel. And Alpha Golf. Goodbye, everyone. Yeah. Visit opposingbases.com where you can leave Romeo Hotel and Alpha Golf an audio or written message. Find them on Twitter and Instagram at Opposing Bases. Or send feedback directly to their inbox at feedback at opposingbases.com. The views and opinions expressed on Opposing Bases Air Traffic Talk are for entertainment purposes only and do not represent the views, opinions, or official positions of the Federal Aviation Administration, Department of Transportation, or the National Air Traffic Controllers Association. All show recordings are done on personal time and personal property. Actual air traffic recordings are from third-party sources, and no government resources are used in the production of the show. There is no nexus between opposing bases and the FAA or NACA. All episodes are the property of opposing bases and shall not be recorded or transcribed without express written consent. For official guidance on laws, rules, and regulations, refer to your local flight standards district office or a certified flight instructor. Opposing Bases offers this podcast to promote aviation safety and enhance the knowledge of its listeners, but makes no guarantees to listeners regarding accuracy or legal applications.